But about six years ago, I was talking to a CEO about strategy. It's a fairly typical thing. He said, Jimmy, shut up. Very typical. I can't even begin to talk about strategy because I can't even man manage my own time and agenda. So he asked us to go away to talk to about 40 CEOs about how they manage their time. And, um, and we've now talked about 150 on this topic. That's interesting in and of itself. But almost to a person, the CEOs, as we were leaving the room, kind of put his arm around our shoulders and said, look, I'm embarrassed about what I'm going to say. Nobody else talks about this. But I'm convinced the CEO job is a battle of energy. If I have energy, if I have energy, I know my job is to be the great simplifier. I know that's my job. When I get tired, I do undue damage to my organization through the complexity I create. And I think this is such a big deal when we think about the starting point of business that where Jack Welsh used to talk about, we think about people in terms of do they get results for my organization and do they share my values? I think there's a third dimension. Do they bring energy or are they energy vampires? And the easy test, which all of you know, is everybody knows someone on your mobile phone that when they call you, you have to decide if you have the energy to take that call. And my one rule of thumb is unless you're married to them, within a year, that person won't be on your mobile phone. We can no longer afford to have that because leadership is about fighting complexity and about be being the one that creates simplifying themes. And it's interesting as you talk about this issue that a week after Steve Jobs died, Tim Cook was asked, what is the one thing you learned from Steve Jobs, right? the ultimate blue ocean guy? And he said, I learned focus is key. Now this gets harder, this complexity point, in a world of globalization. So the rise of international competition makes this thing that, this much worse. And I asked our team to do this. I know it's wrong. But just to look at the audience in this room, how many of you are right now in a global battle? They put some of you in domestic. I don't believe it. But let's just take with the global that most of the people in this room are either right now fighting major competitors in the home market that are international competitors. You are fighting international expansion where you're facing um, huge competitors or both, that this is a real issue for you guys. Now the good news that everybody knows about international expansion is internationalization creates huge growth going forward, 27 billion more, onto, 27 trillion more onto global GDP. That is great. The other good thing about that is if you look at that 27 trillion, actually while it's definitely focused on emerging markets, if you look at the right hand side, Western Europe and the U.S. continue to be massive growth engines for all of you, and we see that. So the good news is with internationalization comes huge opportunities for growth. It also creates new competitors, and they're becoming interesting. So if you look now, you talked about the number that are beginning to enter into the global 500. We are seeing a lot of really interesting global competitors. I put Telenor on there just because it's interesting. You, I'll just give you some anecdotes. Telenor maybe or maybe not know this, expanded very aggressively into Pakistan, Bangladesh, et cetera, with mobile services. They're the now number one bank in Pakistan. They have created more banks through mobile banking than the entire Pakistan banking industry did in 80 years, almost overnight. Petrobras, who you guys may know, I don't know if you know this, just to serve their existing revenue for resource are going to be hiring 200,000 people simply to serve that. Sparebank, which you guys may know. I don't know if you know this about Sparebank in, in Russia. Sparebank is the second biggest value creation story of the last decade behind Apple that no one hears about. So we are seeing new and interesting competitors. They are growing faster than their developed market competitors on top bottom line growth and on TSR. And there's some pretty amazing stories about what they're happening. All of you, I imagine, are facing competition with them in emerging markets. So I'll give you a couple examples. You might know Airtel, which is the leading mobile operator out of India. Talk about transformational strategy. When they came in to run, um, get a mobile license in India, the price per minute was seven cents, and they immediately offered it one cents to play a volume game. Huge share gain. They took it over. They figured out the low cost model to drive it, became number one in India, and now expanding very, very rapidly into Africa as a real competitor to the global mobile operators trying to go in Africa. Bajra, as you may know, it's the number two player in scooters. Huge in India. Actually, at a time, it was the, it was the entry scooter for Indians. At one point, there was a seven-year waiting list 
for one of their scooters in India because it was so good on the price quality trade off. And now they're very aggressively moving into Africa and Southeast Asia with their model. But we've also seen this happening with the emerging markets, as you know, and developed markets, sorry. Huawei, as you know, has now moved up to become the number two infrastructure provider in the US. Amazing repeatable model. Also a huge uh, customer proposition. They've done well at the trade off of cost and quality. And you might know Hire, which is really interesting. I didn't know that much about it. Hire is a little teeny refrigerator company. Went over and started then aggressively in the US, started with college dorm little teeny refrigerators. And over a period of time, they're now the number one refrigerator seller in the US, already beginning to come in. It transforms industries. So I can do this for 20 different industries. It's sparing you time, I'll do it for one. This is looking at global banking. So if you just look at the top 20 banks in global, this is looking in 1999. As we all know, banking had a very good couple years, and we know they had a very, very bad end. But this is what really happened to global banking, a complete restructuring towards the agent and developing market banks. And you can go industry after industry, and the complexity that it creates is that you guys are fighting one market, usually a national to a regional game, and overnight it can become a global game and you can be displaced. Probably one of the best examples, Americans hate me to tell this story, but you all know about Ambev, now ABI, little sleepy Brazilian company. These guys did pretty well on their own. This is EBITDA by billions, by the way, just to keep this company in mind. Merged with Interbrew, they did really well on margins. I'll come back later and talk about them, but went up to 36% margins in beer, for goodness sake. Merged with the Belgian company, became Interbrew. Pretty well in margins, up to 37% took over Anheuser-Busch, which shouldn't make Americans very happy, completely transformed the beer industry. Look at it in billions of EBITDA. Since their founding, this little Brazilian company that's taken over global beer, they've had a 38% CAGR in their EBITDA. So complexity, silent killer growth, and the world is getting more complex with their neuralization. So companies that are winning, I'll just try to summarize as I can. Um, seven things that they seem to be doing well, and I will sound very red team, and I apologize here. I'll try to be purple if I can. But um, first is they build off a, a good core, strong core, and the data is pretty stunning here. I just need to show the data. I said only one in 10 companies grow sustainably and profitably. Of those that grow sustainably and profitably, 95% of them lead in their core business. And one of the issues on the red side is that companies greatly underestimate the importance of leadership in business. But leadership is by far the single most important way to go for sustainable, profitable growth. What is the importance of leadership? It's leadership economics. This data is pretty stunning. And as you guys know, for legal purposes, you're never allowed to use the word dominance very often in your papers. But if you're dominant, far right-hand side of the chart, two and a half times the next player in your industry, on average, those companies get twice return on capital employed at the average of your industry. If you're fighting at parity, you get cost of capital. That's what the natural state of industry should be. If you're a distant follower, trapped in this distant follower on a competitive basis, you barely ever make the cost of capital. And it leads to what we talk about in the red strategy world of the paradox of leadership. And I'll say it twice. The paradox of leadership is the better performing your individual businesses, the furthest they are from full potential. And I'll say it again, the better performing your individual businesses, the furthest they are from full potential. And the reason is simple. Try as you might, in a complex business with different things going on, you, you manage towards average targets. The dominant leaders reach that in their sleep. The followers never get close. And management's time and attention is always focused on the strategically disadvantaged businesses, beating the hell out of them, trying to get them up to average targets rather than forcing the leaders to actually get leadership economics. If you could do one thing to build a strong core, one thing, what would it be? Maniacally focused on customers. There's a problem there. Everybody's done the customer. You all have customer away t-shirts, you've done climbing ropes, customer first, teacups, etc. In fact, 96% of companies believe they're customer focused. You wonder what the other 4% are doing, but 96. 80% believe they deliver a differentiated proposition to their customers. 80% of companies believe they deliver a differentiated propositions. When you ask their customers, in only 8% of cases do they agree. And one of the things we talk a lot about, about 
organic growth within the existing business definition is simply executing on the promises you make in the marketplace is a huge source of competitive advantage. And companies always want, if you think about customer growth, we talk about a design phase, design new stuff for new segments for new places versus a delivery phase. Everybody wants to talk about design. But a lot of competitive advantages in delivery, and it's no secret, again, back to those one in 10 companies that grow sustainably and profitably, that they have twice the level of advocacy as the follower in their industry. So build off a strong core. Second, and this was the subject of the book we just wrote, define a repeatable model for expansion. And we think one of the biggest, probably again representing Red Team from a sounding like a Soviet, is repeatable models is one of the most extraordinary ways to get competitive advantage in the core business. But let me describe it because it's not what people normally think. There are three different principles to repeatable models.